and we're talking about this counter current exchange right here. And with the counter current exchange, it does two things, right? One, it allows us to have increased water and salt reabsorption. The second main thing it does is it creates a high solute concentration in the medulla. There's a reason why when we look at a picture of a kidney, even though we don't see a lot of the tubules and the intricate details, what we do see in terms of the kidney is this. So when we look at a kidney of a cadaver, you'll notice that there are parts of the cadaver, kidney, that are darker versus lighter right here, right? So this region, I don't know, can you guys see this? Right, oh, let's pause for some reason. That's Nothing fine. is showing. Right, so I'm gonna share. Right here. Okay. Right. Oh. You guys can see this picture of the kidney? Ah, Quizlet. Oh, I don't know what's up. <laughs> you guys see, uh, share uh, this. Move this out of the way. Do you see this picture right here? Or yes. no? All right, so this is a kidney, and you'll notice usually with the kidneys, even a cadaver that's not stained right here. All right, usually what we see is that it's much darker in this area. This is the area of the medulla, and the medulla is going to be divided into pyramids. It's actually a pretty good picture, All right? The pyramids then are divided from each other by these renal columns. Now, there's a reason why this region should be darker than this region. So this is the cortex region right here, the external region of our kidney. And notice how lighter in color it is than the darker medulla area that's divided into pyramids. The reason for it is kind of simple. And the reason for it is that in terms of the kidneys, right here, in terms of the kidneys, right, the medulla is darker looking because there's more salt in there. There's more and greater solute concentration. So we kind of mentioned, why is it that the medulla has such a high solute? And what we're gonna see is, is because of this counter current exchange, right? So active transports of sodium and co-transport of potassium and chlorine and other ions out of the thick portion of the ascending limb going into the interstitial fluid space that helps create and then maintain the high solute concentration in the medulla. The impermeability of the thin and thick parts of the descending limb to water. So what happens? We pump out the salts and no water follows. Why is that important? Because all it does allow us to do is just pump out salt. As the salt gets pumped out, there's no water to dilute it. So the salt exits out, goes right into the interstitial fluid space that's then concentrates that fluid space that lays surrounding everything in that area. So we have this the salt being pumped out from the ascending thick limb. The salt then stays in that general area surrounding all of the blood vessels, surrounding all the tubules found in those areas. So now there's gonna be very salty fluid around those areas. Now we're gonna see a salt concentration gradient. Vasa recta removes excess water and solutes without destroying the high concentration of solutes in the interstitial fluid of the medulla. So one of the things that the vasa recta allows us to do is it allows us to reabsorb some of the salts. So then it concentrates the blood on its way down the loop. As the blood concentrated down, when it moves upwards, it's able to pick up all of the water that exits on the descending limb of the loop. When that happens, that water that should be under, coming down, here's a thin de the, the descending limb, the water exits. Well, that water we let stay here, right? If there is no ascending vasa recta, think about that, right? We block this, there's nothing there. Well, what happened? Water gets reabsorbed and moves out on the descending limb. That water then will then start to dilute all the salts that we are pumping out here, right? So we pump out the salt 
on the ascending limb. Some of the salt, a lot of it, stays in an interstitial fluid space. As it stays there, it concentrates the interstitial fluid space. Now, what would happen if I keep adding water to it? If I keep adding water to any solution, I dilute that solution. So what we need to do is have water moved out from the thin descending limb, but that water that is moved out here can't stay there. It needs to leave that region. That's why the basal recta is so important. The basal recta allows us to drain and reabsorb all of that water that moves out. Once we reabsorb all that water that moves out, there's no longer water in the space to dilute the medulla right here. If we didn't have that water going into the ascending limb of the basal recta, if instead I completely shut it down, the water then has no place to go. It can't go in the bloodstream because there's no blood there. There's no bloodstream, there's no blood vessel because I blocked it off. Well, that water then just stays in the, in the interstitial fluid. As it stays in the interstitial fluid, it's going to start to add water to all this salt, diluting it. So then you don't have this high concentration. So as much as we want to reabsorb that water out, we also need to get it out of the fluid space and into the bloodstream. As we remove that water from the space, into the bloodstream, now we can concentrate all that salt. If that water just stayed there, just like adding water to any solution, if you add water to Gatorade, what happens? It becomes dilute, doesn't taste good. Same thing here. If I keep adding water to that medulla, the interstitial fluid space, what happens? That water starts to dilute all that salt. And now it's not as concentrated. It doesn't work as well then. So we need to have that water movement into the basal rectum. Active transport of ions from collecting ducts into the interstitial fluid of the medulla allows us to concentrate. So now we're removing that salt from the collecting ducts into the interstitial fluid space, also that uh, increases the concentration of salt in the medulla. So a lot of things help concentrate the medulla, right? So here we can see, here's our descending loop of Henle. Look at how long that is, right? The deeper in the medulla, the darker in color we'll see. And the reason for it is this, right? The deeper into the medulla, the more salt. And the saltier the interstitial space is. So at this region, way down here, Right? Notice that the loop doesn't go all the way down here, but if it did, this region would be even more salty, more full of solutes than even over here. This region would be more full of salts and solutes than up here. This region up here would be more solute heavy than here. See that? So the deeper we get in the medulla, the greater the concentration of solutes. All right, now that's the reason why having a long nephron loop is so important. The longer the nephron loop, the more water moves outwards. And that water, as it moves out, goes right into the vasa recta. As the water goes into the vasa recta, we have reabsorbed that water. Perfect. At the same time, as it moves into the vasa recta, that water doesn't stay in the interstitial fluid. So we don't dilute the medulla either. Perfect, right? If that water would have just stayed there, we would dilute it. That's not good. So we can't have any more reabsorption later on. So let's take a look at this. This is a loop of Henle, descending limb, ascending limb. So what happens on the descending limb? Well, as it enters here, water exits. As water exits, Look at what happens when pure water exits. What happens? The salt concentration goes from 600 to 900 to 1200. Why? Because only pure water is leaving, right? As pure water leaves, the filtrate becomes more concentrated. 
So now we have reabsorbed all that water. That water that gets pushed out then goes into the ascending limb of our basal recto, the blood vessels that, mo that moves with the nephron loop. So we'll talk about what happens in the basal recto in a second. So the water that exits here, just keep in mind for now, then goes into the ascending limb of the basal recto. Now, the filtrate that makes the U-turn is a lot more concentrated than when we started. Here, it's four times more concentrated. But the longer the loop, it can be 1,800 milliosmoles, right? So here it's just 1,200. As we have make that U-turn, we've reabsorbed all that water. That water has gone into the vasorectal, rectal, right? The filtrate has lost water and become more concentrated because of the water loss. On its way up, we start to pump out salts, right? So then we pump out salts here. As we pump out the salt, what happens? That allows us to be in equilibrium. The salt that's being pumped here allows us to concentrate the, uh, the medulla. The salt that's pumped on the ascending limb is what causes water to want to move out on that descending limb. Because remember, water needs a reason to move, and the reason is high solid concentration. So as water exits out, it exits out because of high, how high the concentration of solutes are. But we're so efficient at pumping salt out that by the time we hit the collecting duct, instead of 1,200 milliosmoles of solute, we're at 100 milliosmoles of solute, meaning we have reabsorbed 1,700% of what we saw here, which is crazy, right? Now, the salt that we have moving out on the ascending limb, the thick ascending limb of the loop, goes into the descending limb of the vasorectal. rectal. And the next one probably does a better job, and I think I just I destroyed that <laughs> last slide, so I gotta make sure I don't save it. So this slide shows it even better. So here is that relationship, the counter current mechanism. What we're gonna see is, Here's a basal rectal right here going and making a U-turn. Here's the basal rectal at the very start. Blood's gonna move down and then around and then up. We call this counter current because as the blood moves down the descending limb of the basal rectal, it's going to encounter filtrate moving up the ascending limb. So one's moving upwards, the other's moving down. Right, so what happens? The ascending limb of the loop of Henley, we're pumping salts. Some of the salt, a lot of it, stays in the interstitial fluid, helping you concentrate the interstitial fluid. These numbers are a concentration of solutes in the interstitial fluid. Why are those numbers so big? It's because we're pumping the salts out of all nephrons, and all of their ascending limbs. So all those salts get pumped out on the ascending limb, concentrating the interstitial fluid space in the medulla. Some of those salts that are pumped out on the ascending limb of the loop, some of it goes into the descending limb of the vasa recta. So on the descending limb of the vasa recta, we started with 300 milliosmoles of solutes. Perfect, that's physiological, right? That's normal. As it comes down, it picks up salt. So it should become more salty. It should be at 600 here. As it comes down even more, picks up more salt on the descending limb. 900, goes all the way down. It's picked up a lot of salt, 1200 milliosmoles, right? Why? It's because of the salt that are pushed outwards here, some goes into the bloodstream, into the basal rectum. So as the blood moves down, it picks up more and more salt, more and more salt, more and more salt. By the time it makes a U-turn, it's picked up the maximum amount of salt, 1,200 milliosmoles of salt. I have concentrated that blood from 300 to 1,200 here, 400% concentration. That's a lot of salt. Right? It is so salty that when blood moves up the ascending limb, 
What's attracted to it? The water that moves on the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Remember, in the loop of Henle, water moves outwards, right? And only water. It moves up because of osmosis. As water moves up because of osmosis right here, that water then goes to the next area that's very concentrated, the bloodstream. As water goes into the bloodstream, all that water moving into the bloodstream dilutes blood on the ascending limb. So then as it picks up more and more water, it is going to become more dilute. Here, 600 milliosmoles instead of 1,200. As it picks up more and more water, 300, 300. Perfect. Right? Just almost like what we had at the very start. Right? Now, what does this countercurrent mechanism allow us to do? It allows us to reabsorb salts and reabsorb water, a lot of it. At the same time, it allows us to concentrate our medulla. By concentrating the medulla, it allows us to have further reabsorption for the next time this flows through. So then we can have further reabsorption of water and salts as well, continuously. Now, keep in mind, if you're ever confused, I want you to think, what happens if we stop everything? By giving you a LASIK pill, right? By giving you a loop diuretic, I block all of these pumps here on the thick ascending limb. If I block all of the pumps on the thick ascending limb, if I block all the pumps here, what happens? I no longer have salts moving outwards, right? If I no longer have salt moving out, what happens to my interstitial fluid space? Well, now it's gonna become like the rest of it, 300 here. Before it was at 600 because I pumped all that salt, right? But now I'm no longer pumping that salt. So it's 300 here at the very start, 300 here, 300 here, 300 here. It's all in equilibrium at 300 then, because there's no salt pumps. Would water want to move out then? No. Water only wanted to move out in the descending limb because the fluid surrounding that tubule was so salty. And water is attracted to the high salt environment. Now there is no high salt environment. Now this is at 300. This one's at 300. This one's 300. Oops, right? What happens when they're all at 300? There's no more salt movement. When that happens, right, there's no more water movement either. No more reabsorption of water. The water that should be reabsorbed into the bloodstream stays in the tubules, stays in the collecting duct, allowing us to urinate excess water out. That's why loop diuretics work on edema, on high blood pressure, right? is because it allows us to get rid of excess water. And that's how they do it, by blocking those pumps. By the way, they have done studies and they have shown that by giving people loop diuretics, they actually obliterate this concentration gradient that was present, right? They obliterate it, it's no longer seen. Now the good news is, right, if you stop taking it, it comes back, right? But if you have high blood pressure, you might be on it for years. And it will take you a while to get the concentration back. Now, urea also responsible for a high osmolarity of the, in the medulla. And the reason is it can be reabsorbed and it stays in the interstitial fluid, allowing us to then concentrate the interstitial fluid space even more. Now, we talked about in the distal convoluted tubule collecting duct, Right? There's a lot more variability here than anywhere else. 65% always in the, in the proximal, 15% always in the, all the nephron loops. Right? In the distal convoluted tubule, in the collecting duct, we can go from 19 to 20%, making sure that we have 100% reabsorption of water. Again, that's not good. Right? We'll only see that if we are severely dehydrated. If ADH is present, then what we're going to see is almost 99.9% .9 water reabsorption. Keep in mind, 
if you don't produce urine, you can't get rid of urea. That's bad. That's what causes the toxicity seen when people have chronic kidney failure or renal failure. Right? Regulation of urine concentration, renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone. When we have a drop in blood pressure, renin is released from the kidneys. Renin activates something called angiotensinogen that's produced by the liver. Angiotensinogen and so that OGEN, G-E-N, is an zymogen. It's a protein hormone that's produced too large and inactive. All right. Now, the name tells us what it, what it does. Angio, blood vessel, tensin, tension. It should increase blood vessel, blood pressure, right? So what happens? When you are dehydrated, your blood pressure starts to drop, right? Now, that doesn't have to be from dehydration. It can be from bleeding and you have hemorrhage. Anything, it can be shock that does it, right? Anything that causes a drop in blood pressure causes renin release from the kidneys. Renin then gets released into your bloodstream from the kidneys, starts the first step of angiotensinogen activation. So it goes and cuts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 goes into your, into your lungs where this enzyme, ACE, we know coronavirus, enters our lungs, the cells of our lungs, by ACE receptors. These are, this is an enzyme receptor that they're talking about. Angiotensin 1 goes into your lungs where we have ACE receptors that work as enzymes. Those ACE receptors that works as enzymes finishes off cleavage of angiotensin 1 to the more active functional form, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 will go into your blood vessels and cause them to slightly vasoconstrict, increasing the blood pressure slightly. Then angiotensin 2 goes to your adrenal glands, causing aldosterone release. Aldosterone then will allow us to put more sodium, potassium channels in, sodium, hydrogen channels into our distal convoluted tubule and cells of our collecting duct. What happens when we have more sodium and, and sodium hydrogen, sodium potassium channels? Well, we have more sodium that can come into the cell. More sodium that's reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And a little bit of water follows with it. Hopefully, that will then allow us to stabilize your blood pressure. Keep in mind, the only thing that will increase it is to get increased water volume by drinking or an IV, right? This will hopefully just stabilize it so then it just doesn't fall off a cliff. Angiotensin II, right, works on the smooth muscles of your blood vessels, causing them to be slightly vasoconstricted. That alone should help normalize your blood pressure. And then with angiotensin II causing the release of aldosterone, that little bit of water movement can also increase the amount of water we reabsorb, which can hopefully, again, it doesn't increase it, but it makes sure that it's at slightly lower normal level, levels. It doesn't just fall off a cliff. That's how aldosterone works. For aldosterone, you need sodium to be reabsorbed, and a little bit of water follows. The next one doesn't. ADH. Now, I want you to know the differences, right? Number one, how is aldosterone release versus ADH? Number two, function, mechanism of action. How does aldosterone work versus ADH? Aldosterone, where is it released? Adrenal glands from angiotensin II activation, right? That's how it gets released and where it got released. How does it work? It worked, its mechanism of action is insertion of sodium channels. Insertion of more sodium channels allows more sodium to be reabsorbed and more water follows with it. ADH is different. ADH is released from a completely different area. 
it's released from your pituitary gland, not from your adrenals. It's also released, right, into the bloodstream, and it works on the same group of cells in the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. Now, its mechanism is different, right? So its release and location is slightly different. Location is completely different. One is a pituitary gland. One is the adrenal gland. Adrenal glands are really, really close to the kidneys. They are superior to the kidneys. Immediate, they actually lie immediately on top of the kidneys. The two arteries in the brain. So they're far apart. The mechanism is different. Aldosterone requires sodium channels. ADH doesn't put sodium channels. What it does is activate the transcription and translation and therefore production of aquaporins. Aquaporins are water channels. So that only water goes through. Notice no salt is released and no salt is required. So what we get then is pure water movement into the bloodstream. Now, what EDH does is it tries to lower your blood osmolarity. When it's summer and you're working out outside, you start to sweat. As you start to sweat, water is lost from your body. And the water then, right, is usually taken from the blood vessels. So then the blood vessels has less water. The blood vessels become more concentrated as solutes then because of the water loss. Which one will decrease the osmolarity? Aldosterone or ADH? Aldosterone will not decrease, right? Aldosterone will allow some water to be reabsorbed, but you need to bring a lot of salt into your bloodstream for that to happen. So it might actually increase your blood osmolarity. ADH though, doesn't require any solute for you to reabsorb that water. So ADH's mechanism is pure water entrance into the bloodstream, hopefully decreasing the osmolarity there. Now again, it never will completely, because in order to do that, you will just need to drink pure water, right? That's the only thing that will. But what this does do is it makes sure that your osmolarity in the bloodstream isn't so magnificently high that it really starts coagulating the blood and causing real major issues in the blood, blood vessels, right? And here they're telling you the ADH mechanism with ADH, pure water moves out of the collecting duct. As pure water is moved out of the collecting duct, then the filtrate as it goes through the collecting duct loses water. What happens to any solution that loses water? It becomes more and more and more and more concentrated. So when we are slightly dehydrated, we're gonna have a lot of water reabsorption because we have a lot of ADH secretion, specifically in the collecting duct. What happens then? The water that's reabsorbed no longer is found in the filtrate. And we have smaller amount of urine release. That way, we can keep water in our body. Perfect, because you, don't, you didn't drink any, you're dehydrated. The last thing you wanna do is lose more water through urine. Now, what happens when we don't need ADH? You just drink it or just had a lot of water, right? What happens? There's no ADH secretion. The collecting tubules and the collecting ducts no longer make water channels. So there's no water channels. Water can't exit out of the tubules. It stays in the tubules. As it stays in the tubules, now we have more water in the tubules. We have more volume of urine, and the urine itself is gonna be very dilute. Perfect, that's what we want, right? We want to produce large amounts of dilute urine when we drink too much water. Now, other hormones, we talked about ANH, atrial natriatic hormone. Some book calls it atrial natriatic peptide, atrial, nat atrial natriatic protein even, right? Now, this is a complete opposite of aldosterone. Aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption. This one decreases sodium reabsorption. 
So it's only released when you have excess amount of blood volume. You drink in a lot of water, you've had you know, your two big bags of potato chips, and now you have to drink even more water. Well, now we have more water and more salt we need to get rid of. ANH is released, so then we decrease sodium reabsorption. We already have enough sodium. And now because there's no more sodium reabsorption, there's more sodium in the filtrate. There's more solute in the filtrate, keeping water in the filtrate, making sure that you urinate out excess water. Now, plasma clearance, inulin, not insulin. It is inulin. Inulin is what we use to measure your plasma clearance and therefore how healthy your kidneys are, right? We can't just give you salt and figure out how long it takes to urinate it out, right? Everybody has different levels of water that they can exit out by urine. So we wanna make sure that your kidneys are working functionally. How do we measure that? We measure it by what we call inulin clearance. We inject inulin into your body and see how long it takes for you to urinate all of it out. Now, you should, usually it's almost like an, a whole day type of test. So you're only doing this if you think you have chronic renal failure or acute renal failure. And what we do is this, when we check your blood, right, we're gonna see people that have high BUN levels, blood urea nitrogen. High BUN is a sign of either dehydration or it's a sign of renal failure, right? One is completely normal. We can just give you water, completely treats it. One is a severe difficulty. So we need to figure out which one is which. We can't tell just on that blood, right? We can't tell on your blood tests, your BUN, whether it's going to be dehydration or kidney failure. We can't tell on a CT. We can't tell on an X-ray or an MRI, right? We need to figure out how the kidney is working. So how do we figure it out? We inject you with inulin. Inulin is nothing toxic, but the important thing about inulin is we can measure it, right? We inject it in you. It is, right? It is not reabsorbed at all. It is not secreted. Whatever is in your body will be filtered and excreted. So if it's filtered and excreted, we can tell right, how long it takes for you to get rid of it. So what we'll do is we inject it into a person and then follow them over the course of a day. Every time they urinate, we measure their urine and measure the concentration of inulin they release in your urine. Because it's not reabsorbed, whatever gets filtered gets pushed out in the urine. So by telling us, all right, we put giving them like, you know, one liter of inulin. And now after like three, four hours, they've gotten rid of it. All the inulin's out. Well, that's a pretty high filtration rate because whatever was filtered moves out. We don't reabsorb any of it. So it allows us to tell us if you do have a high filtration rate. And if you have a high filtration rate, it's a sign of an active kidney, right? If you have a lower filtration rate, now, instead of half a day, right, you've urinated, and now it takes you another day to get rid of it, was well, a sign that your filtration rate is too slow. And now it might be acute or chronic renal failure. We use this as well to see how long, if that disease has progressed, right? How deep are you into this disease progression? Is it getting worse? Is it getting a lot worse, right? And we do this inulin clearance to measure that. Use it to calculate urine plasma flow and therefore urine filtration rate. That's a big one. All right, and here it just talks about diabetes that when your blood sugar exceeds a, you know, a maximum amount, a lot of that glucose then goes in a filtrate and does not get reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Almost done. Right. In terms of urine movement and the rest of this, understand that once that filtrate moves through and into the renal, the minor calyx and the major calyx, 
right? It's now called urine. Then it goes out through the pelvis. The pelvis then continues as a ureter. The ureter, and I do want you to know this, is highlighted, right? Contains transitional epithelium. Keep in mind, transitional epithelium is stratified. Because of that, it is very, very, very protective. Why do we need protection in the lining of our ureter? It's because our urine is slightly acidic, right? It can range from a pH of 6.5 to a pH of 4. That's pretty, big, pretty acidic, 4. So we need to protect the urinary system from the acidity of its own urine. At the same time, transitional epithelium can stretch. So when we have more urine flow, we can stretch it out and accommodate that increased urine output. Perfect. It can stretch when urine's going through. When urine's past that area, it can snap back to its normal shape. Now, the urinary bladder right here is lined with transitional epithelium as well, protection and stretch. At the same time, it is all smooth muscle. The smooth muscle here has a name detrusor. So the smooth muscle actually has a name, the detrusor muscle. You guys have probably heard about the you know, medication for women called Detrol. Detrol is used for women with incontinence. If you've had a couple of live, you know, like uh, vaginal deliveries, what happens is a, there can be weakening of the pelvic wall and it can lead to incontinence. People laugh, people cough, sneeze, and a little bit of leakage of urine comes out. That's incontinence. Now, we give detrol. Detrol is a portmanteau. Combination of words. Detrol is det, detrusor, control, right? Detrusor control. Det, uh, trol, right? The trol is from the control. So you can then, when you urinate, increase the contraction of the bladder. So then you can empty out the bladder completely. As you empty out the bladder more completely, well, there's no urine there, right, at that point. Now, there will be urine coming back in immediately, but there'll be less of it. So when you do laugh and cough, right, you will then have less leakage because there's less urine. The trigon is an area where the ureters come in and the urethra exits. Now, that area where the ureter comes in, it actually comes in from underneath and it comes in at a weird angle. Because of this, we should never, and it, because of the way it comes in, it forms a pseudo valve, right? Not a real valve that we saw, like the pyloric valve, the ileocecal valve, not like that, but it forms a pseudo valve. Because of the angle it comes in, it makes it hard for urine stored in the bladder to move back into the kidneys. When urine has a tendency to move back into the kidneys and into the ureter and then back in the kidneys, there's a chance for a kidney infection. We don't see that much because of the angle at which the ureter enters. We do see bladder infections though, especially in females. The reason why is simple. Look at how long the urethra is in the female. Very short, very easy for microbes to enter the urethra and go into the bladder. That's why you don't, you know, if you have a five-year-old girl and they have a urinary tract infection, we just give them antibiotics, that's it. If you have the same five-year-old boy and they have a urinary tract infection, we immediately do a lot of imaging studies. Right? We don't just give them antibiotics. We want to figure out, is there a reflux? Is there a problem with the bladder? Why? It's because the length of the urethra in males is so much longer that it should preclude boys from getting UTIs. They can get it, but when they do, usually we think there's something more at work. Now, there, all right, for males, we see a more fixed internal urethra, urinary sphincter. So here is the, right, where the detrusor muscle comes inwards right here. For females, it's not as tight, it's not as strong, this internal urethral sphincter. For males, right, 
it's going to be a little bit stronger, a little bit more tight, right? The reason why is simple. In males, the bladder and the right seminal vesicles, as well as the ampulla of our vas deferens, everything goes through the, ure the urethra, right? Everything goes through the urethra, even urine. So when people are having sex, the last thing we want is to have urine being removed and moving out instead of ejaculate, right? So when there is sex and there is ejaculation, this internal urethral sphincter activates, making sure that it's only the sperm and the seminal fluid that exits out, not urine, right? Women, the urethral sphincter connects to the bladder and the urethral, but it's not that region where we have that penetration, right? We have then when we have sex, it's through the vagina. So for females, the sexual reproductive system and the urinary system, completely separate. For males, they're very similar and they're linked, right? So the urethra in males is gonna carry urine and seminal fluids and semen. For females, completely different. So for males, this internal ure urinary sphincter, much more important. We both have strong external ur urinary sphincters. And this is a true pressure valve where you can control when to urinate, right? Right here, up to a point, you can control when you urinate. Now, effects of aging, gradual decrease in size of kidneys. The crazy thing is in order to function and normal homeostasis, all we need is one third of one kidney, which is nuts, right? So we need here people going through acute renal failure, chronic renal failure, and they need, you know, lots of time, right? Look in nephrologists, right? They need a kidney transplant. That means almost both kidneys have failed at that point. And this is also the reason why when we do give somebody a transplant, all we need is one kidney, not two. Amount of blood flowing gradually decreases, meaning that, right, we're gonna have decreased, uh, decreased blood flow, decreased filtration. Number of glomeruli decrease. Ability to secrete and reabsorb decreases. Ability, there's a big one, ability to concentrate urine declines. Kidney becomes less responsive to the ADH and aldosterone increasing the risk of dehydration and death. This is the reason why in 1999, it hasn't, I mean, it's 20 years ago, but in 1999, there was a heat wave in Chicago. We shouldn't in this day and age, it's only 20 years ago, right? See so many deaths from a heat wave, but we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of elderly people died because of it. Why? Well, because normally they're old and they have a harder time thermoregulating. So even though it's hot, sometimes they wear a sweater. At the same time, they can't concentrate the urine. So they keep urinating out. As they keep urinating all that water out, they become more and more dehydrated, making it harder for them to thermoregulate. Because then if there's no water, you're not going to sweat. If you're not going to sweat, you can't cool down. And you have this bad positive feedback effect all eventually leading hundreds and hundreds, right? I believe like 2,000, right? Elderly people died in Chicago because of that heat wave. Now in America, right? It's like 20 years ago, right? But it did happen. It's because of the inability to concentrate her. Reduce ability to participate in vitamin D synthesis and which contributes to calcium deficiency and osteoporosis. All of that, our effects of aging. All right, any questions? I'm just gonna pause the recording, all right, stop it.